Hi, this is Tracy. Welcome back. We're going to do a brief review of the anatomy and physiology of the female reproductive system. This is going to be part of chapter of Unit 2. You can find it in um, Chapter 5 of your Women's Health book. So let's go ahead and get started. So reviewing the anatomy and physiology of the female reproductive function, you can find this uh, photo um, similar to this on page 66 in your textbook. When you are looking at the structures of the female genitalia, you need to be aware and know what the external uh, structures are. So you have the mons pubis, which is a fat pad that covers the symphysis pubis. You have the labia majora and labia minora. Uh, the labia majora is utilized to protect the inner vulvular structures and the labia minora is compromised of connective tissue and smooth muscle. It's highly sensitive. It sits anteriorly from um, the prepus or hood-like covering of the clitoris and frenulum fold of the um, tissue is below the clitoris. The clitoris is located underneath the prepus. Um, it is the female erectile tissue. And then the Bartholon gland is the gland that secretes mucus during sexual arousal. If you move on and take a look at the internal stu structures, uh, the internal structures provide the passageway for menstrual flow. It is also part of the birth, you know, your birth canal. So you have the vagina, which is a fibromuscular collapsible tubular structure, and during reproductive years, it develops. Um, rugae or transverse folds that help allow for childbirth. The uterus is basically an upside down pair and that sits midline in the pelvic cavity. So we're going to go ahead and move on to a cross section and now you can see a cross section of the internal organs of the female. So if you look at your uterus it is that upside down pair um, it's supported by ligaments and divided into two major parts. So some oftentimes women complain of cramping or contractions when they hit um, you know mid pregnancy and a lot of that is due to those ligaments and those round ligaments stretching so you do just kind of need to be aware of that especially when you are working um, in women's health so the two major parts are the upper triangular portion called the corpus and that is the fundus or top of the uterus and when women are pregnant, obviously that uterus was going to expand. And when they are pregnant, the idea with the fundus being the physician will do measurements from the top of the fundus to the top of the pubic bone. And those weeks of gestation should match up with the inches that they're measuring. You will also need to know about the fundus in the postpartum period because the fundus is what you check and ensure that, that stays contracted after delivery so that that mom doesn't bleed out. The lower portion is called the cervix. That's very, very important during childbirth and labor and delivery. The cervix dilates and stretches during childbirth. It secretes mucus in response to ovarian hormones and is covered with squamous cells. So the idea behind the cervix is as that stretches and opens, that occurs during uh, labor and then when the woman is 10 centimeters we, and that cervix is very very paper thin we call that complete and then that is going to be a time that the baby will start to um, descend down to the birth canal um, and hopefully have a normal vaginal delivery. Um, with de decreased estrogen as women age we're, they start to see dryness thinning of the vaginal walls and smoothing of that rugae and like we talked about that rugae is that stretchy material that allows for childbirth. The uterus um, serves for reception, implantation, retention, and nutrition of the fertilized ovum and fetus. So, you know, if you don't, if the woman doesn't have a uterus, obviously she's not going to be able to bear children. There's three layers to the uterus. There is the endometrium that is highly vascular, and that's what's shed during menses. The myometrium is made up of smooth muscles, and the myometrium and is responsible for the smooth muscles of contraction of labor and the peritoneum covers the abdominal wall. Uh, the uterine tubes are the passage of ovary to the uterus so you, the uterine tubes, fallopian tubes um, are terms that you're going to need to be aware of. <clears throat> In looking at another photo of a cross-section of a female, um, you can see that there are different types of uterus 
um, different different lays um, as far as how they are set inside of the woman's pelvis. Um, so you can have retroflexed, retroverted, antiflexed, midline, which is what we really like to see, and antiverted um, is common. So you'll see the bladder sits above the uterus and then the rectum sits below. This is a photo that I will put on doc sharing if you'd like to, to uh, utilize it for reference. So in looking at um, an additional photo of the um, woman's female reproductive system. Um, the thing that's important in this when we're looking at this is the uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovary. So what you need to be aware of when you are looking at these is we need to be aware of the egg cycle and how that egg is going to be released and then passed down through uh, the fallopian tube where um, conception typically where conception takes place. So that's going to be where the sperm and egg unite. And then that egg will eventually travel down that fallopian tube or uterine tube and come to implant inside of the uterus. Um, so when you're looking at this photo and you're looking at the cervix, you can see with a closed thick cervix looks a lot like this. And then during labor and delivery, that cervix is going to open up, stretch out, thin down. And when that stretching and thinning down occurs, then the baby is able to pass down through the birth canal. Now we're going to turn our attention to uh, the ovarian cycle and talk a little bit of how that um, oocyte comes to mature and be released from the ovary so that we can hope for implantation and conception of an embryo. Now we're going to turn our attention to the ovarian cycle. Um, before ovulation, typically about 1 to 30 follicles uh, begin to mature in each ovary under the influence of follicle-stimulating hormone and estrogen. Um, there is a pre-ovulatory surge of luteinizing hormone that is going to affect a specific follicle. Um, the oocyte is going to mature then and ovulation occurs and the empty follicle begins its transformation in the into the corpus lutum. And so when you're looking at this, you can see that as it matures, then it makes its way to the corpus um, lutum. This follicular phase um, of the ovary varies in length from women to women. So that is why some women have 21 day cycles, 27, 35. So it just is dependent upon um, that length of the follicular phase. On rare occasion, uh, more than one follicle is selected and then more than one oocyte matures and undergoes ovulation. So that's when you're going to be looking at um, maybe multiple births. The luteal phase begins immediately after ovulation and ends with the start of uh, menstruation. So when after ovulation, there's a significant estrogen level drop and some women might have some mid uh, menstrual bleeding, but typically it goes unnoticed. Um, the post ovulatory phase of the ovarian cycle usually requires 14 days. Um, the corpus luteum reaches its peak of functional activity eight days after ovulation. Um, and then it starts secreting the steroids, estrogen, and progesterone. So the importance of that is that um, the time of peak luteal functioning, the fertilized ovum can be implanted into the endometrium. Um, if no fertilization occurs, uh, then that uh, corpus luteum regresses, steroid levels are going to drop, and then two weeks after ovulation, if there is no fertilization and implantation does not occur, that functional layer or that first layer of the uterus will go will be shed and the women woman will go ahead and have her menses. Um, remember that fertilization does occur in the fallopian tube. It's typically the upper third portion of that. And that really kind of wraps up our um, overview of anatomy and physiology of the female reproductive system. If you have questions, once again, please bring them to class, stop in, um, email, let us know so we can get your questions answered.